Hello, everyone. My name is Urs Gasser. I'm with the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And I also have the great um, pleasure to be involved in the global network of Internet and Society Centers. Uh, it's a network that brings together uh, more than 100 centers around the globe. And today it's my um, pleasure and honor actually to uh, be in conversation with two colleagues from Europe, from Germany, uh, working at the Bavarian Research Institute for Digital Transformation, in short, BIT, that's easier. Um, uh, Sandra Selmanovic uh, is the research coordinator at the Institute, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and Professor Alexander Prechner is the head of the board um, of directors of the Institute. Uh, and a warm welcome. Thanks, uh, thanks for being in conversation today. Uh, I wish we could be together in person, but I guess that's uh, what it is. Well, so thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah, Thank you. so um, no, it's a pleasure really. Um, the Institute, as I understand it, is uh, within the Bavarian Academy of Science and Humanities. And um, as I was, uh, you know, taking a closer look in preparation of this call, I've been so impressed that you have managed really to build kind of a unique uh, institute that's different from other centers um, in that it's truly networked in its DNA. You have uh, colleagues and faculty members um, from, from different um, institutions working together. So it's not only multidisciplinary, it's also multi-institutional. And I was wondering whether you could just share, um, Sandra or Alexander, just a a few, uh, you know, give a high level overview how you're set up and uh, what maybe also some of the topics are that uh, that are, you know, focal areas of this um, network institute. Right. So, so maybe, maybe I, I, I take that one uh, since I have have uh, well tried to set things up or I did set uh, things things up the way we, we did. So um, as you said, the, the Institute is um, part of the Bavarian Academy of, of the Sciences. Uh, and there's two reasons for that. One is it's a fantastic place, the Bavarian Academy of the Sciences. Uh, and the other reason is it's not one of the universities. Um, and as we wanted from the beginning to involve different universities and different expertise within Bavaria, uh, we may have had, or we would have had probably, political issues when we would have set that up at one specific place, right? And as all political landscapes, sometimes it's it's good not to be at one specific place, but maybe somewhere in between. And I guess uh, that was one of the, the, the drivers that, that eventually led to, to the Bavarian Ministry of the Sciences and research to, to um, fund this, this research institute. Now, we uh, have an institute that is a physical institute. We have a building and we have something like 32 people living and working in that building, modulo corona at, at, at the moment, from totally different disciplines. And we have a board of directors that are associated with different universities across Bavaria. And these are people from computer science, like myself, from information systems, from philosophy, from law, from sociology, uh, uh, from politology, and from other places. And, and I think they are the, the best that we could have found in, in, in Bavaria. And of course, because this is funded by the state of Bavaria, um, it is a Bavarian um, initiative. And now that um, institute is existing in itself, but the, the main ideas in terms of where to go um, content-wise with that institute, that is something uh, that we discuss within the directorate, uh, within the board. Um, and that's why we have that, that, that institutional uh, setup here. So we have an institute that is on its own, located within the Bavarian Academy of the Sciences. But the directors have main jobs in different places at different universities. And we do that as a side job, um, so to say. But all of us are extremely interested in setting up interdisciplinary um, research. And that's why we do that. And it's also, um, I guess, born from, from the inside that if you want to do interdisciplinary research within a university, that usually is more complicated than if you do that across universities. And, and I guess you have, have made the same experience. Sometimes it's easier to work with a colleague 6,000 miles away uh, than with a colleague that is just across the aisle, that is across the, the corridor, right? And there's good reasons for that that maybe we don't need to delve into, but I think it, it's good to have something like that outside universities. I think it's also necessary to do that outside universities and because at the moment, our academic system 
um, is not really rewarding interdisciplinary research, right? If you want to uh, go for an academic career, um, then maybe it's not the brightest idea to do that as a junior researcher in, in interdisciplinary subject areas, but maybe you rather get yourself a name in one specific subject and then somewhat more senior people like you and me and Sandra can get into that world of, of interdisciplinary research. The reason being that um, the way we are measured um, is usually with respect to one discipline. And everybody knows that if you have interdisciplinary research, then from the monodisciplinary perspective, sometimes the results that you are getting aren't too exciting or they seemingly are not too exciting, but the value really is at the connection, at the intersection of the different um, um, subject areas that, that we are seeing. And that may be another reason why I think it's the right thing to do that, not within one university, but maybe as something that is sitting in, in between these. these Good. And um, that really is, is the, the, the setup. Now, that has, of course, fundamental consequences. And um, because if you want to do interdisciplinary research, and again, who, who, who am I telling that? And um, you realize that is difficult. I'm a computer scientist, and I realize that it's already extremely difficult to talk to engineers or electrical engineers, even though from other disciplines' perspectives, we are very close to each other. Um, we, we are not, right? So in terms of language, in terms of culture, it's, it's really difficult to do that. And we already call that interdisciplinary. And now if you do that with social scientists and philosophers and... and oceans and, apart, oceans right, apart. Right, it's oceans, oceans, <laughs> oceans uh, 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 apart. And then it's, it's again a totally different question. And the question is how did you organize that, that work? And this is one of the, the driving principles of our institute. We try to adopt an agile research methodology. And now... Agile, of course, means that we are fast and quick and, and it's a buzzword, of course. But there's a few things that, that I think are really important and that are something that we need to take from or that we can learn from agile development processes that, as you know, stem from, from computer uh, uh, systems. And one of the basic ideas that, that, that people have had in the context of programming, in the context of software development, was that if you try to develop a system, then it's usually a bad idea to have the overall system done by 10% and then by 20% and then by 30%, bah, 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 then all parts done by 100% and then you integrate them. That doesn't work, right, for a variety of good reasons. So what that agile methodology is, is propagating or is, is, is advocating is the idea that instead you have one part of the functionality, one meet intermediary result that is done by 100%. And we call that a feature in, 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 in computer systems. And then we add another feature that was done by 100% and we integrate. And then we go for another feature. And now how does that translate to, to interdisciplinary research? Well, if we think about what we can done within one month and we talk about an artifact that is done after one month, then we can try to integrate that with the rest. So rather than having the legal person and the technical person and the, the, uh, the philosophical person, if, if you wish, and think about their problems and then integrate their results in hindsight, we try to do that all the time with something that is always done by 100%. And I think this is one of the crucial, crucial ideas. Good. So that's Thank maybe you. That's the first uh, yeah, that's... matter of, 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 of ideas here. There's, of course, plenty of other things that I'm, I'm extremely, as you can see, excited to, to talk about. Yeah, no, this sounds really exciting. And, and Sandra, this is a good moment to bring you into play. I know from personal experience that um, these sorts of even super agile organizations uh, need a lot of coordination, <laughs> a lot of coordination, especially if Absolutely. many institutions are involved. And so it's just wondering, how do you on the ground manage um, and coordinate um, projects. Uh, I think Alexandre pointed out um, at the faculty level, at least uh, people uh, have more than one job. And, and so how, how do you organize that? I see lots of uh, um, sticky notes in your background. Oh, yeah. Is that part of it? Or how, yeah, that's how does actually that the outcome. Practice? This is the outcome of one of the meetings we had just prior to Corona, uh, prior to the measures, prior to the lockdowns in, in February. But in practice, how we do that, how we try to adopt this agile research management approach as well, is that we organize 
meetings with all the staff members and all the research projects that we fund and that we conduct ourselves. And we do that in uh, six, week, uh, six weeks intervals. So every six weeks we meet with the staff members and we look at what has been done so far. Are there any problems? What are the challenges? How does the interdisciplinary collaboration work since every single project is uh, an interdisciplinary project? Um, and that's actually been working quite nicely. I mean, we've had some challenges this year. Obviously, we had to digitalize some of those meetings uh, on a quite short notice. We had the last one uh, just yesterday where staff were presenting work in progress, but we are quite pleased with the progress despite the challenges. We have now had 10 quite good journal public publications coming out uh, of the research uh, projects, uh, the external ones. We have had about six or seven uh, from the internal projects uh, within 2020. So I think it's been quite, quite effective. Um, and then we also really try during those gatherings every six weeks to, uh, to create space for networking between the projects and try to see whether what kind of uh, similarities we find between the projects that could be built upon in terms of creating new research collaborations uh, in these areas. So yeah, it's been a challenging year, uh, but it's been nice. And actually we also had a hybrid event. We still managed to do a hybrid event in September where half of the participants uh, were uh, present in person and the other half were participating online and it worked really well. Participants really liked it. Um, and I think that will be the future. I think we will uh, be seeing much more uh, of these kind of hybrid uh, events. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can add one one sentence here, also, if if you permit, uh, and, and that is something that that Sandra was 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 alluding to, and that that I didn't mention before. So we have two kinds of projects. One is projects that we do within the institute uh, in an in interdisciplinary way, and we have people who are, are, are employees of the institute um, um, proper that work on these things. But at the same time, we also have the role of a funding agency in a set in, in a sense because we give out money to Bavarian research institutes to. Uh, have have projects to have other interdisciplinary projects because we also realize that even though we have a fantastic board of directors uh, we don't know everything right and we can't cover cover everything uh, and and i guess the the extra complexity of what sandra is is doing an, an excellent job at is uh, that we have to coordinate projects within the institute and that already is is a beast but there's a bigger beast and <laughs> the bigger beast is to coordinate projects with uni with university research institutions across bavaria yeah, I'm intrigued. Again, I, uh, one of my personal passions is to uh, to figure out how academia um, and science and, and, and research can be reconfigured that it is more networked, right? And what you're describing, as I said at the beginning, feels uh, very much like a, a, an alternative model, how to organize collaborations and yet still create the synergies. Um, and, and some sort of the visibility and the impact. So that's why I started with the model question and not the substantive question, uh, but, um, but definitely we want to get to substance too. And you mentioned some um, of the projects and I encourage the viewers to check out the website. It's a, it's a really impressive, um, not only list of projects, but also cutting edge topics that are that sound just really interesting. So I was wondering, Alexander, I realized you you have one project in particular that you were involved um, as a as a um, uh, principal investigator that's looking at, at the integration of ethics into software development. And of course, that's a topic that um, you know, on, on, on many people's mind also within the network of centers and um, is some sort of almost like a, a symbol of, of what we talked about building these bridges across disciplines. And I was wondering whether um, you would be willing to share a little bit more about what the project is about and, and uh, what some of the challenges are as we are, you know, doing this uh, work to bring philosophy into into engineering into software design right so thanks thanks very much for for the question of course i'm extra excited about that that <laughs> work and at the moment we are really intensely working on that and i, I think it's extra cool <laughs> but but I'm, I'm not the one who should who should who should judge that i guess um so let me maybe start with the, the second question what, what is the challenge um the challenge is different cultures, different mindsets, different ways of thinking 
different templates in, in, in your brains, right? I, as a computer scientist, think in a specific way. You, as a legal person, think in a specific way. I think you and I, we aren't too far away from each other. But if you talk to a sociologist um, or politologist, they, they have a different way of thinking. They have a different worldview. Uh, and, and in fact, we, we tried to set up these institutes uh, for, for a couple of uh, years, and we had some preliminary uh, institutions. Uh, and I think it was very valuable for us to have these, these preliminary institutions because that taught us respect for, for other disciplines, right? So if I, I, I may, may uh, make that point a bit more, more tangible, and I'm exaggerating things, of course, here. Yeah? So here's, here's a very black and white uh, uh, worldview, right? As a computer scientist, I have a problem, I have a solution, I have a scientific contribution, I write that down in 10 pages, okay? That's it. And if I talk to a sociologist or a philosopher, then it's not exactly that they always want to solve a problem, but it's rather that the problems they have are so huge and have been tackled for, for, for millennia, and that rather what you can do is you can add to the discourse. And that's a totally different mindset because it also means that you don't have, end up with 10 pages, but rather more, and you don't really have clear problem statements or, or that kind of things. And it turns out that, that of course, you need to learn that respect because first time you're confronted with that kind of thinking. Um, it's, it's, it's baffling because you think, hell, why, why can't that person be a bit quicker, right? And the other person of course thinks, oh, come on, that computer scientist, why can they be or why must they be so reductionist? What the hell is going on here? And you need to, to get to know each other and you need to learn to like each other and you need to be respectful with each other. And I think this is still the, the, the main challenge that, that we have. We are just currently writing, and I'm getting to the ethical project in, in one second. We're just, just writing a paper on, on some things. And I realized that a, a philosophy colleague who, who was, was working with us on the paper sometimes just jotted down statements of a specific kind. And he said X in an indicative way as a statement. Uh, and, and then he was developing arguments uh, around that. And I said, come on, wait a minute. You need to substantiate that. You need to have references, empirical studies that substantiate the claim. And it turned out that this is something that is not that relevant or that often the case in philosophy. Totally different kind of thinking. And it's very important to understand that my way of thinking is not better than their way of thinking and vice versa. It's just different. And we need to understand to do that. And I think, again, the key word here is, is respect. Now, in terms of, of integrating ethical deliberations into software engineering, which is exactly what we are trying to do and which is a bit more, more fine-grained than, than what you've asked about, um, the, the question is the following. Uh, essentially, it's a question about responsibility. If we build modern technology uh, and that technology can be a weapon and everybody knows that this technology can be a weapon if it is abused or if it is used in a, in a certain way, the question is, um, what is the responsibility of the different involved stakeholders? And what we are particularly interested in is what is the responsibility of a specific engineer? And that, of course, means already that there's a few decisions that have been taken before. Society has taken a few decisions before. Uh, and the company or an organization has taken several decisions before people are taught to implement a specific system, okay? And I'm perfectly aware that if a company has decided to build weapons, then you as an engineer, you may not like that, but if you don't like that very effect, then this is maybe not the right company for you. So there's a few things that you cannot discuss about as being a software engineer. But then there's plenty of things that you can influence as an engineer. You can think about the way that data is used. You can think about logging mechanisms. You can think about transparency. You can think about accountability and that kind of things. And now what we thought or what we observed was particularly interesting is that again, an agile development that we were talking about before, um, what you have is empowerment of members on the team, right? The traditional way of software engineering was, hey, here is a design of a system and you code monkey, go ahead, implement it, right? This has totally changed. Now, what we have is we have a problem, we have a requirement, a vague requirement and the development team is about to solve or is meant to solve that problem. And they have a lot of freedom in how to do that. And now in the sense that they are empowered by agile development methodologies, we think they should also consider ethical concerns. And what we have done is a deliberation schema that can be used throughout the development, where essentially we try to interweave the process of ethical deliberation with the development process. 
And one, one, one final note here is uh, what we often see is, is that ethicists are accused of, of being useless, right? Because people say, no, you come up with, with this and that, uh, yeah, sure, but how can you actually tell us what to do? And that is demanded too much. You cannot ask them. What ethicists can do is, is they can sensibilize you for different topics and they can make you think. And this is precisely what they have done you, but you cannot expect them to give the answers. And why is that? Because software is so diverse that you cannot expect a specific set of answers. And what we have very recently done is, is and, and we have just submitted the, the paper, is, is a, a study of codes of ethics for software engineering or for engineering. Uh, and there's about 130 of them. And our understanding is they are essentially useless because <laughs> they give you advice of the kind, um, don't do evil, be good, <laughs> respect human nature. And, and I mean, that is of course true and that's certainly not wrong, but does that help shape decisions within development processes? Certainly not. And that's why we think it's relevant not to have these codes of conduct or codes of ethics, but rather have a deliberation schema that we interweave with the development process. Fascinating. And this um, also a topic that I'm very interested in. We just recently wrote the chapter on uh, professional norms as a source of governance when it comes mm -hmm. to AI. And, and uh, one of the many interesting points you made um, echoes very much with me, and that is that we have a problem with contextuality, right? Um, that uh, many of the applications and technologies we are talking about um, are, are highly contextual and, um, and it's very hard to make generalized value statements about them uh, at the level of a law or a policy statement or even a code of conduct. And so the question then becomes, and I think you, you provided a possible answer to it. Well, how can you do justice to these uh, contextual differences and nuances? And the idea is, well, by, you know, putting the decision-making, um, to put decision-making and deliberation at the level of where context is shaped and where context is emerging uh, is extremely powerful as opposed to, you know, having some sort of lofty, but impossible to translate principles. So, I absolutely agree with, 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 with that, that, that statement. Um, and uh, the question, of course, is who is the right person to acknowledge what the context uh, is, right? And here's one example, and we are currently working on a, on a study on that. Take facial recognition, face recognition technology, right? As such, most people would now say, oh, oh, this is evil. But if you look at face recognition technology in context, it's a totally different meta, right? You can use that in hospitals, you can use that in public spaces, you can use that in a car where the car is meant to recognize who you are, and you get totally different requirements and totally different ethical deliberations and results, right? So I perfectly agree with what, what you said there. Thank you, Sandra. We've been talking about so far um, uh, about the knowledge creation process and building, you know, these bridges across institutions and disciplines, and that's hard enough and already a, a big deal. And uh, you're doing a wonderful job facilitating that. Uh, yet you're doing more than that. You're also building interfaces uh, that these insights, that the knowledge that is created. Um, is serving the public, is serving the world in, in one way or another. And I notice also from, from your own CV that you are very much um, focused at the interface also of, of um, research and academia and policymaking. And uh, so I was wondering uh, how your institute is approaching this question of, well, not only produce world-class uh, papers and, and prototypes and things like that, but, but make sure that some sort of decision makers, be it in the private or public sector, learn about it. And so I was wondering this translation across uh, spheres, how that plays out at the center and what programs when I center, I mean institute in your case, uh, what are some of the programs you have uh, to enable this um, transfer or this kind of translation process? If you want to share a few ideas before we then have to wrap up, unfortunately. 
Yeah, well, basically the Institute is structured in three main parts. We have the research area, we have a think tank, and we have a dialogue uh, department, if you want. And what we do is we organize regular events and meetings with the public and with policymakers where we uh, report on our results. Uh, we've also had some events where we've had panel discussions uh, with uh, our researchers, with uh, policymakers, uh, uh, who have attended them. So I think these have been this year the main vehicles. Well, at the end of last year and early this year, we did quite a few in-person events with the general public. So events of around 300 with 300 uh, visitors. So that's how we are trying to kind of, that's really central for us that we communicate all our work to uh, the general public and to policymakers. So far that has mainly concentrated on Bavaria and Germany. But now what we are trying to do, and we have done quite a few things, is to increase our international outreach activities as well and uh, influence um, or contribute to internationally relevant research, which we are already doing, but also build partnerships to build on what we've already done and, uh, uh, and be more visible internationally. And I guess that's also this meeting here and our membership in the network of centers is, is one of these uh, uh, is one of the reasons uh, is our international ambitions to, to, to really get a bit more known uh, internationally and, uh, and disseminate our, our work. And we have already started to, uh, we've been, uh, we've had some formal meetings with the Oxford Internet Institute, Professor Alp Schröder visited us and contributed to a panel discussion of a, a public event, had various networking discussions with us. Um, recently at our hybrid event, Professor Marina Girotka from Oxford University as well uh, gave a keynote speech on responsible robotics and Professor Alexander Frechner will be giving a seminar uh, in Oxford as well. So whilst we do have really excellent networks from the side of our board of directors who are uh, renowned academics, we need to really build up more of these uh, uh, international activities as an institute with some formal collaborations. And, um, and just very briefly <laughs> to, to, to mention uh, our very recently launched uh, international uh, research fellowship, uh, which we've also circulated actually only a few days ago uh, to all the members of the network of centers. And already a day after we received the first application of a staff member, uh, from one of these uh, centers in the network. So, so that's been great. We've uploaded that also in the, in the virtual village uh, booth uh, of the NOC uh, now. So we'll be looking forward to, to, to more applications there. Uh, but yeah, so these are the kind of activities we are trying to, and we are very young. I mean, we started last year. I myself joined the Institute in November uh, 2020. Um, and we have also been in the process uh, in the first four months of defining the kind of challenges and uh, main uh, areas of focus for our research. Um, and then the, what you see behind me, those post-its, that was actually uh, when all our projects came together in, in February this year, we asked them to tell us what kind of contributions they will be making to our challenges that, that we have defined. <clears throat> and that's what came out of it. So the idea also next year, in addition to the International Fellowship, is also to start now creating, since we have some first results from the projects is to start creating some kind of a knowledge map and bringing together the outputs and the knowledge created in those projects um, and continuing to disseminate it amongst policymakers and the general public. That sounds fantastic and uh, hopefully we have a chance to follow up um, also bilaterally. Um, this is something we aspire to do also at the, the level of networked organizations like the Global Network to create such a knowledge map. It's extremely difficult to do because everyone is so busy naturally, but I think it will be an incredibly powerful tool to understand who's working on what and visualize the intersections and have easier pathways also for policymakers to uh, find the, the resources that are already there and for us uh, from the research side also to identify synergies going forward. So very eager to learn from your experience as, as you undergo such a mapping and uh, wanted just to end one by congratulating you. It's almost amazing what you've already achieved and built in such a short time. Uh, it's truly impressive and, and also inspiring. 
Um, and second, of course, to thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be um, on this uh, call uh, today. And we're really looking forward, I'm looking forward uh, to collaborating uh, much more over the months and years to come. And this uh, was just a wonderful uh, start to um, maybe share a few of the topics and also learn from the model that um, you pioneered uh, with your institute. So thank you so much and uh, have a great weekend. And thanks again. And thank thanks, you also yes. for organizing all this, by the way. This is also a lot of work with that network, and we very much appreciate your, your effort there. So thank you very much. You're, you're very kind. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.